In 1838, German biologists Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann discovered the cell structure of all living beings, including humans, disclosing that the joining of a sperm cell and egg cell at fertilization generates a new living organism, or individual member of the species. An organism in the species Homo sapiens is called a human being. From that point of conception onward, that living human being is capable of creating its own cells, separate and apart from its mother. That process of cell division and multiplication in a human being continues uninterrupted until, say, 90 years later when that human's heart stops beating and brain activity ceases and death takes over. Then, and only then, does cell replication cease. That life begins at conception is true in all species of mammals, not just humans. In 1878, Walther Fleming published his findings on chromosomes, which revealed that at conception, 23 chromosomes from the father and 23 from the mother joined together, forming a new paired set of 46 chromosomes, different from both father and mother and unique to this new human being. In 1953, the DNA molecule was discovered by James Watson and Francis Crick, expanding our knowledge of human life and further validating its beginning at the point of conception, when that new human being has its own unique DNA, determining every genetic feature it will have in its lifetime, whether male or female, the color of its hair and eyes. Everything bestowed by nature is possessed at that point. It is not just a mass of cells belonging to the mother. It is a separate and distinct human being growing inside its mother. Whenever there is uncertainty on any scientific issue, there is always research going on to settle the matter, and invariably, there are multiple theories. There is no research going on into any open question as to when human life begins. There is no second opinion in science on when human life begins. It is settled fact as much as that the planet Earth is round. Every science textbook and every accredited college, university, and medical school in the world that has a chapter on human reproduction reads the same on this issue. And yet, in 2008, candidate Barack Obama, a Harvard-educated lawyer running for President of the United States, was asked by Pastor Rick Warren in an interview whether he acknowledged that life begins at conception. Obama struggled and finally answered that it was, quote, above my pay grade, unquote. Pro-abortionists have been so successful at sowing this confusion that even anti-abortionists get befuddled on it. In debating stem cell research, President George W. Bush once said, quote, in my opinion, life begins at conception, unquote. Even anti-abortionists mostly don't grasp that it's not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of fact. Some social and political movements in this nation have survived long past the time they should have expired by sowing doubt in the minds of the public. For example, back when the tobacco companies were struggling to deny that smoking caused cancer, they paid unscrupulous doctors and people with science credentials to stand up and say, well, we're scientists and we don't know for sure that smoking causes cancer, so therefore there is disagreement in the scientific community. Then a notorious memo was discovered and made public, passed from a tobacco executive to an advertising agency that said, we don't have to sell cigarettes, they sell themselves. All we have to sell is doubt. That phrase became famous. We are selling doubt. That same memo could have been written by an executive in a coal or oil or power company today. All we have to do is sell doubt about global warming and we can keep selling our product unhindered. But no movement has been more successful at selling doubt than the abortion movement. Put a thousand pro-abortionists in a room and ask for a show of hands. You'll be lucky if a dozen of them acknowledge that life begins at conception and therefore every abortion ends a human life or kills a human being, however you care to phrase it. To stubbornly believe that the beginning of life is other than conception is a condition known as invincible ignorance. There's an organization called the Flat Earth Society, which insists that the Earth is flat in spite of all evidence to the contrary. It is a monument to invincible ignorance, hopefully tongue-in-cheek, but I'm not sure. 
If the only way that a person can hold on to a position is by clinging to ignorance, then what does that say about the position? The conscientious intellect must reconcile his or her opinions to the facts. So if you continue to support abortion, then do so in full recognition of the fact that every abortion kills an innocent, defenseless human being. It is intellectually dishonest to deny that fact or to couch it in euphemistic phrases, such as terminating a pregnancy or exercising reproductive choice, to obscure the truth from yourself and from society in order to make the practice more palatable. Call it by its right name. Look up the word homicide in your dictionary. It is the killing of one human being by another. The abortionist is certainly a human being, as is the fetal boy or girl that he kills. So in point of fact, every abortion is a homicide. Don't cloud the issue by mealy-mouthing inaccurate words. All pregnancies are unintended for all other animal species, and it was likewise with humans for mostly all of our 200,000-year existence. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to accept unintended pregnancies any more than we accepted polio. But pregnancy is not a disease, and we work to cure diseases because we want to preserve human life. The protection of human life is the foremost moral principle of the human race. Science has provided the tools and techniques to kill prenatal human beings without much risk to the mother. But to engage in the practice as a cure for unintended pregnancy is selfish, short-sighted, cruel, and contrary to the most fundamental precept of human morality.